Hi everyone and welcome back to Bye Holly G. Welcome to today's video. So I have been meaning to sit down and talk to you guys about my master's research project for quite a long time now. And if you don't know me from my main channel, then I should say that yes, I have just finished my master's at UCL in cancer biology. And as part of that master's, I did a data analysis project, which ran for about three months. I should also say that because of the pandemic and everything, we weren't allowed to go into labs. And so I did everything at home at my desk, at my computer. It just goes to show that biology these days is not just about lab work. Data analysis is really important in biology these days. So that's today's video. I really hope you guys enjoy it. As usual, give it a thumbs up if you do. Comment down below if you have any other questions and definitely subscribe if you want to stick around for more biology content. So yeah, we're gonna dive straight into the background then. So I did my master's in cancer biology and my project was based on a particular form of cancer and it also had quite a lot of epigenetics in it. I do have a video on epigenetics, like an introduction to epigenetics. So if you're interested, you can check that video out. I will leave it in a card up here actually on this side. So the particular tumor type was low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. So a sarcoma is a tumor or cancer of connective tissue like muscle, bone, fat, and that is one of four types of endometrial stromal tumors, which have been reclassified very recently by the World Health Organization. And your low-grade endometrial stromal sarcomas, they are malignant tumors, so they are cancer. And they are thought to be the malignant counterpart to endometrial stromal nodules, which are benign. So they're not cancer. And the low-grade endometrial stromal sarcomas, they are quite indolent tumors. They are quite slow growing. However, they are still cancer. The first thing to say about endometrial stromal tumors collectively is that they are incredibly rare. And the second interesting thing about these tumors is that they harbor quite distinct chromosomal translocation events. And a chromosomal translocation is basically where one section of DNA or one bit of a chromosome is abnormally fused to another chromosome. And what can happen as a result of this chromosomal translocation event is you can bring together two genes that aren't normally fused together. And as a result of that, you can generate what we call a protein fusion or a chimera. And that is like a novel protein. In cancer more generally, Cancers are characterized by mutation events. Mutations are changes to the DNA sequence and you can get a whole variety of mutations. You can get very small scale mutations. You can also get large scale mutations. And these translocation events, they are large scale mutations, you know, like bringing one chromosome to another and joining them together. That's like a big, quite drastic change. And with the low grade endometrial stromal sarcomas in particular, the ones that I was looking at, they have in 50 to 60% of cases, a fusion protein called JASF1 SUSY12. So that is the name of the fusion protein and the two genes are JASF1, which is located on chromosome seven and that is fused to SUSY12, which is on chromosome 17. So it's what we call a T717 chromosomal translocation. That's just how we name chromosomal translocation events because we've brought together chromosome seven and 17. So let's start with JASF1 and I'm gonna put it very simply first and then go into a bit more detail. Jazz F1 was first known to basically inhibit gene expression downstream of another protein. More recently, however, we found out that Jazz F1 can also activate gene expression as part of a different complex. So it has quite diverse activities, but now going into a bit more detail. So the first function, as I said, is that it silences gene expression downstream of NR2C2 or TAC1, and it basically acts as a transcriptional co-repressor. So it silences the gene expression downstream of TAC1. And then the second function, as I said, is it can activate gene expression because very recently we realized that Jazz F1 is a new subunit of this really, really big complex that we call new A4 or the TIP60 complex. Complex. So a complex is basically a big structure made of lots of different proteins, so lots of different subunits. And NUA4 is basically responsible, as I said, for activating gene expression. So how it does that is it acetylates histones, it causes histone acetylation, and that is an epigenetic mark that kind of like allows gene expression. It also conducts histone exchange. So it replaces one histone for another, and that also helps to activate gene expression. But most importantly, NUA4 is responsible for activating genes. Secondly, let's talk about CZ12, because there is so much known about CZ12. It is basically 
a subunit of another complex that we call PRC2, Polycomb Repressive Complex 2. It is very well known and it has been very widely studied. It essentially is another epigenetic complex. NUMA4 acetylates histones, whereas PRC2 methylates histones. And it specifically methylates a histone residue called H3K27. And this residue, this H3K27, it can be monomethylated, so a single methyl group can be added. We can add two, in which case that's dimethylation, or we can add three, and that's called trimethylation. And that third trimethylation, that H3K27ME3, that is kind of like the most canonical mark deposited by PRC2 because that is the hallmark silencing mark. It essentially results in gene repression. It silences gene expression. So most often when people think of PRC2, they think of gene silencing because of this trimethylation. It essentially compacts the chromatin so that a gene can no longer be expressed. So that is Jazz F1 and CZ12. And as I said, they're brought together as a result of this chromosomal translocation that we see in low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. And the most striking thing about this fusion protein is it basically bridges the activities of NUA4 and PRC2. Because as I said, Jazz F1 is a new subunit of NUA4 and CZ12 is a component of PRC2. So this fusion protein generates what we call a super complex or a mega complex because it harbors both the activities of NUA4, which as I said, results in gene activation, and PRC2, which results in gene silencing. So you have this really big complex that is abnormally formed in these tumors, and it's got the ability to both activate gene expression and silence gene expression epigenetically, which we don't normally see in normal cells. And that we think is ultimately what is driving tumor growth in low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. And what's also interesting is there are other genetic translocation events in low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. However, very interestingly, all of those translocation events always brings together a subunit of NUA4 and it always fuses it with a subunit of PRC2. So we always end up with this super complex, as I said, that has the activity of NUA4 to activate genes and PRC2 to silence genes. So let's now move on to talk about what I aim to do as part of my project, so part of my research project. And because this was a data analysis project, I was given all of the raw data to work with. It wasn't as if I acquired that data myself in a lab. I had been given data that showed me where this fusion protein binds throughout the whole human genome. And that was derived from a protocol in biology that we call ChIP-seq. So that stands for chromosome amino precipitation and high throughput sequencing. And what ChIP-seq does is it calls peaks. So those peaks are where the fusion protein binds throughout the genome. And so I could visualize all of that data and I was also provided with the information on the nearest genes to those peaks. It is quite important to say that this chip seek that had been performed against this fusion protein but in mouse embryonic stem cells. Now this is the model system, you know a big drawback of this study and the work that I did was that you know it's not the most physiologically relevant to human low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma because first of all you know these are mouse cells and secondly we think that low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma comes from cells that we call human endometrial stromal cells those would have been a better cell type to use and i was supposed to be getting data from those cells however due to time constraints and stuff i didn't manage to get that in time to work with as part of my project so my first aim was basically just to interrogate where jazz f1 suz12 is binding throughout the genome. So look at this in quite a lot of detail. And I was also comparing it to controls. And I used a program called Deep Tools to do this. And Deep Tools uses Python tools. So I had to basically write scripts that would allow me to plot heat maps to show me where the fusion protein was binding throughout the genome. My second aim was to characterize the binding sites of Jazz F1, so to characterize those peaks and see if there were any particular sequence motifs enriched in those binding sites. A sequence motif or a consensus sequence is recognized by what we call transcription factors in biology. So transcription factors come along, they bind to the small sequences and they regulate gene expression or they change gene expression. So I wanted to characterize the JALF1-SUSY12 peaks to see if there were any 
enriched sequence motifs to see if it you know potentially recruited other factors or worked with other factors to regulate its gene expression and i used a program called homa so homa is a motif discovery platform it basically takes a sequence so it would have taken this peak and it would compare it to a reference genome and it would see if there were any statistically overrepresented sequence motifs in those peaks essentially. The third like big aim of my project was to try and broadly understand some of the functions of the genes that are regulated by the fusion protein because as I said I was given the raw data for not only the ChIP-seq peaks, but also the nearest genes to those peaks. So I wanted to look at those genes and see what their functions were basically. However, because I was given such big data sets, it is virtually impossible to go through all of those genes and look at their individual functions. Like that's just never gonna happen, you know? We are humans, we're not machines. So I used what is called gene ontology analysis. And this is something that's really clever to be able to do. What I did was I used this platform, this online, website called gprofiler it's really really easy to use but what i could do with that is i could input lists of genes and then what it does is it kind of like characterizes and it summarizes the main pathways the main biological processes and the main kind of disease associations related to those sets of genes so it is so much easier to interpret you know as i said it's basically impossible to look at all of the functions of those genes because there are just so many and i basically analyzed the data from gprofiler using excel and then i made heat maps and stuff and then the fourth thing that i did kind of like throughout my project was i was not only given the chip seek data for the binding sites of the fusion protein and all of the controls obviously but you can also use chip seq so again it's chromatin immunoprecipitation and sequencing to map different like histone modifications so i was given the raw data that showed me the distribution of histone acetylation and also h3k27 me3 so i could see where all of those marks were throughout the genome and those had been mapped in the mouse embryonic stem cells that were like only expressing the fusion protein so i was trying to then see how these histone modifications were affected or altered by the expression of the fusion protein and then in terms of my results i will talk you through some of like my main results obviously there was stuff that i would have liked to have done but i didn't have the ability to do that because i was just given the raw data and you know i still had so much data to analyze and work with i had a lot of figures i was struggling to get under the word count you know but there are always things that you can do next the first thing related to like the binding of the fusion protein throughout the genome so that is in short dysregulated and then leading on from that in terms of the histone modifications, so histone acetylation and H3K27 ME3, there seemed to be reduced H3K27 ME3 and increased histone acetylation. I don't wanna go into too much detail, but those were the main changes. And if you think about that, if you reduce histone methylation, so the H3K27 trimethylation, and you increase the acetylation, what you're basically doing is you're creating a chromatin environment that is gonna allow gene expression because H3K27 is a silencing mark, whereas histone acetylation activates gene expression. So the fusion protein seemed to bias gene expression. It seemed to create a chromatin environment that would allow genes to be expressed. Obviously that is just me looking at the histone modifications. I couldn't say exactly how gene expression was altered and future studies would need to look at all of the genes across the genome and see how they're altered by the expression of the fusion protein. In terms of its functions then or the functions of the genes that it regulates or is most likely to regulate some of those functions were related to like stem cell properties and in cancers they often take on more stem cell like characteristics they were related to a particular signaling pathway that we call wimp signaling in other papers wimp signaling is often overexpressed or hyperactivated in low-grade endometrial stromal sarcomas so i could draw a big parallel there and wimp signaling this signaling pathway is also related to stem cell like properties other genes that it seemed to be regulating were related to cell migration and in cancer cell migration is really quite important because once tumor cells can start to migrate, they can start to invade the local tissue and potentially spread around the body in metastasis. And yeah, that is basically 
everything i feel like this video is longer than i thought it was going to be but i hope that was useful that was interesting to listen to you know as i said at the start it was very much related to yes one particular type of cancer but it had a lot of epigenetics in it and i really love epigenetics it's such a new and very rapidly growing field definitely check out that video if you're interested i also have another video which is all about the basics of cancer um, if you want to learn more about that. So that is everything for this video. Definitely stay tuned for more content in the future. Subscribe, as I said, and turn the notification bell on so you know when I upload. And yeah, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. As always, I will speak to you very soon in another video. Bye!